Do you feel like Saudi Arabia could become the next big player in football? Inevitably, there is only one decisive factor that would make the Saudi Arabian League anything special. Saudi Arabia has been on the up when it comes to sporting events. WWE, boxing, recently the football, Formula One is going there. They say they don't want to go, but they still go and drive around there. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the One Kick From Glory podcast. It's all of us here today live and direct going to start things up a little bit differently a small bit different not too majorly different um but if you're listening and watching on spotify please let us know how you found the episode please like it comment rate it if you're watching on youtube please do the same we're always looking for people to let us know how they find things and episodes and stuff but how's everyone been this week i want to start with you matthew and work our way around uh, it's been it's been all right been enjoying most of the hot weather it's trying to stay cool welcome thunderstorm as far as football is concerned it's like I don't know, it's taking, they're taking like the sports direct, the sports direct approach, clearance sale, everything just must go. We're like the new sports direct FC at the moment. Every minute, every day, just looking around, it's like, it's never a dull moment with football, is why I love it. Even when there's no kick of the ball in Premier League anyway, someone's always going down. Always going down. Man. And we'll, we'll definitely touch on that sports direct element a bit more in a little bit. Um, Craig, how's your week been so far? Been challenging, but I've been okay. Watching the cricket on spare time and enjoying it. So, yeah. And skipped right. away from football to cricket. And you, Mark, how's, <laughs> how's it been so far for you this week? Yeah, week, week's been okay. Apart from my country letting me down. Um, you know, losing to Kazakhstan. Gotta love it. Um, but, yeah, no, it's been good. And, and you, you, were, you were there in the stadium. What, what was that experience like, watching the game live? Yeah, atmosphere was fantastic. Like, you know, one thing that, you know, you will say about you know, Northern Ireland fans is they really go and they really make some noise and, you know, they're chanting, you know, their different songs about Georgie Best and, you know, all, you know, their Ulster chants for, for the, for the entire game. And, and it's, it's a wonderful experience, um, you know, and it was the better team comfortably, but, you know, just some poor defending at the end where they decided to take each other out and not the actual player they should take out. And the Kazakhstani forward runs through and, pops in the net and a, and a fair shout out to the Kazakhstan fans they were fantastic like 50 of them just in the corner down there making lots of noise um but um but yeah I think that that almost kills off Northern Ireland's chances of the Euros but um three one nil defeats in a row now to Denmark Finland and Kazakhstan so yeah there you go I mean on the one hand that's great consistency you know it's only one nil I mean, <laughs> Kazakhstan is a bit, it's a big negative. I mean, you didn't want to lose against them 1-0. But, you know, there's consistency there. 1-0 defeats every time, so there's something <laughs> to build on. At least it's showing that defensively you're you're solid most of the game, except for the moments when you have a lapse. And offensively, there's work to be done. Um, so yeah. yeah, well, Kazakhstan beat, um, beat Denmark um, 3-2 um, in, in, in an earlier qualifying game, which was, was a very impressive result, but just kind of threw a spanner in the works there. But um, the other team in the group uh, are the mighty San Marino. And um, I did a little bit of research on San Marino because Northern Ireland beat San Marino 2-0 away from home. And, and I'm, I'm going to be looking to get tickets to go to the home game because I need a guaranteed three points. Um, and um, San Marino have won one international game in their entire history that was back in 2004 they beat Liechtenstein 1-0 in a friendly they've never won a competitive international game um, a qualifier for the World Cup or the Euros um, and in all of their games they have scored a grand total of 29 goals whilst conceding 803 <laughs> You see, the, the problem with odds like that is you don't want to be the outlier to make it their second win in a long time <laughs> And it's primed that way. That's, that's, I mean, look, if, if you're a striker low on confidence, you know what, what game coming up that you want to bag in, definitely. And if, if you're a person who, who's, um, you know, familial history might be a bit, I'm not sure how to, you know, determine where you're from. I'm saying San Marino could get a call up. I'm just saying some of you guys out there on YouTube, you might want to play San Marino. You might become a legend if you bag the gold, at least <laughs> the first, the next win, the second win in all these games. But, you know, it's been, it's, I, I feel like we can comfortably say, you know, we've had a, having a heat wave here in the UK. It's been nice. Um, it's not universal across the whole country because I know that in Scotland they had torrential rain, which affected their game last night. And for us, it's been a heat wave. It's been nice. We're, we're all sh in shorts, more or less, in the studio, which you can't see. If you can see, if you can't, don't worry about it. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I think, 
you can say in the world of football, it does feel like the times are changing. I want to start off with a topic that's not top of my list, but one that I think is going to be quite interesting to see how this season pans out. There's been all this talk about the amazing work that CBS has been done with the Champions League coverage, you know, with Kate Addo, Thierry Henry, Micah Richards and Jamie Carragher, how the four of them together is a great chemistry. It's been really entertaining to watch every time. And there's lots of question marks about what, you know, the other networks would do. BT have, well, there's rumours that Laura Waters might be going there. It's not Laura Waters. What is her name? Or from Sky Sports. No, Laura from TalkSport. Laura Woods. Laura Woods, not Laura Waters. Laura Waters is someone from work. But Laura Woods <laughs> might be going there um, to, to take over, which could be quite interesting if that happens. But I want to shift over to the other major player in the field. So the BT Sport are now going to be called TNT from next season. Sky Sports, been around for donkeys. They were the first ones in the UK to, to kind of bring that level of broadcasting to football and sports. But we had the news actually come out earlier on, back in the last week, start this week, that um, Martin Tyler has been retired off or not going to be at Sky, broadcasting at Sky Sports from next season, which is, is a massive transition. And we're going to be heading over to Peter Drury, which I feel like for a lot of people, that's that's a massive upgrade. I think Martin Tyler's standards have definitely dropped over the years. For you, Craig, what's one of your favourite Martin Tyler moments. Aguero! <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that. I remember the one he did for Tony Adams when he won the league in 98 as well. That was a good thing mm. as well. He's had, some, he's had some classic moments as a pundit as well. So he has. What about you, Matthew? Moments. What's one of your highlight ones? I second the Aguero! Just because of the, te like, the tempo of the game, the stakes, what was, it, what was going down. It wasn't a straightforward game. And just the last kick of the last season of the game, giving City first of their many titles. But I think everyone that day, I was anyway, I was I was a secret Man City fan that day for the league. I just didn't want Man United to win. But just how it went down was absolutely unforgettable. It's like in football folklore and his voice just kind of, you felt the passion in his voice. But another one that's sticking out was when I think he believed it, he did the Champions League final. And if something sounds better than Aguero, it's Chokpa! That bass in his voice when he put that header away like he always does. Like it was, and you felt the thing. And he, again, you just felt the relief and the passion in his voice because it's like, you know, he wants to back the English team. The game was kind of going nowhere for a bit. They scored and it equalised. And it's like he wasn't ready for... It happened in the course when we left, lift, lifted the trophy. Like it was just a sweet, sweet, sweet moment. So yeah, he will be missed. He's going to be missed. Yeah. For you, for you, Mark, when you think about this transition, obviously Martin Tyler, like we say, he's had quite a few legendary moments. I mean, my favorite one is when Omri scored against Chelsea at Highbury. It was the, I think it might've been the 2-1 game or 2-2, but it's, it was a long ball out the back from the back, Kolo Tori, dropped it. We don't, we don't usually do long ball football. We dropped it onto Omri's head. Omri headed it down to Reyes, who returned the ball to him. Omri took one touch of his right foot, left foot volley. It's like, the hit man is Omri! <laughs> because, you know, you guys know what Omri's all about. But for you, Amar, how big do you think this transition is going to be for them now, moving to Peter Drury, who we know has had some amazing legendary moments, especially in European football when he's been commentary. How big is that going to be now for Sky? Yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a good move for Sky. And I think the, the main thing is they want to maintain the consistency, right, of, of you know, quality commentary uh, from quality commentators. So, you know, I, I think for me, like, you know, you want them to have them big moments in the big times, but for the rest of the season, you almost want them just to kind of, do their job and not be noticed. Um, you know, there's nothing more frustrating than watching a football match for 90 minutes and the commentator thinks he's the best player on the pitch, right? Like, you know, it's just like, you know, you're, you're, you're the supporting act, like do your job well. And you may have a moment or two in the season where, you know, we focus on the supporting act and give them a round of applause, but really there's you know, 22 other stars that we're here to watch and it's not you. So I think, you know, that's, that's kind of what I'm looking for in my commentators. Um, and, you know, good luck to Peter Jury for the, for the new season. Yeah, it's definitely going to be an interesting tra transition and we'll see how they do. Obviously there's a lot of pressure on them to give us world-class action. You know, we said CBS are the market leaders right now and Sky have got to step their game up because if not, I'm sorry, but we will find a way to watch CBS in the UK through whatever means necessary legally, <laughs> of course. But obviously the other big changing point, and it's having a big 
topic of discussion this summer is, of course, the influence of Saudi Arabia in football. We know with the deal that brought Karim Benzema over to Saudi Arabia that they effectively gave him the choice to pick what club he wanted to choose and join. And that is practically unheard of in world football. I've never known of a club, a country just giving someone money and saying, choose where you want to go. That's, that's unprecedented. But I want to start with this review on this note, Mark. Like, do you feel like this Saudi Arabia could become the next big player in football? Because I know when we talked about this a few weeks ago, we did say, just looking at the implications of what it could have. And you did say that he didn't really think he'll be that much of a serious player because obviously they're getting a lot of players that are getting towards the end of their careers but the key determinant was going to be if they started picking up some younger more promising players but do you think that they are likely to be the next major player or is this just China and the MLS version too but with just more money in the Middle East yeah my, my views haven't changed I you know I know they signed Ruben Neves and if anything I just lost confidence that Ruben Neves has any ambition as a footballer um, to be honest um, more than more than thinking Saudi Arabia had made it um, and and yeah I think I think at the end of the day they have lots of money to spend so it is a kind of China 2.0 and you know inevitably there is only one decisive factor that would make the Saudi Arabian League anything special and that was if they were allowed to play in the Champions League um, if they, if you gave that league three or four Champions League spots, players might be more inclined to move there because they'd still be able to have the ambition um, of playing and winning the biggest trophy in European football, and and that could give them something to 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 kind of build. But for as long as that's not on the table, um, and the UEFA president seems to seems to think it's not going to be on the table anytime soon, um, I don't think it should be ever on the table either, personally, but. Um, but yeah, for as long as that's not on the table, I think it will just continue to be a place for, you know, ambitious list Ruben Neves is to go and make 400k a year, um, or, sorry, a, a week. Um, and, you know, um, and, and players who wouldn't necessarily, you know, be able to do anything in the Premier League, like Graciano Pele to go and be on 250 grand in China a, a week, like, you know, whatever it was like, you know, so I, I think, I think it's, it's really just 2.0 in in my opinion and people will talk and they'll talk about the players that go there and and they'll make them they'll make them seem like they're better than they are because that's the entire that's the entire marketing you know process that's going into all of this but i i think all in all we we've seen this before it, it's just done with a little bit more money it is done for a little bit more money i mean there's a lot of interesting players that have been linked with moving over to saudi arabia obviously Coming over to you, there's a, quite a few of your quote unquote deadwood that you're looking to shift over there. There's been a lot of talk about the potential influence of um, the Saudi public investment fund potentially investing in the consortium that owns Chelsea, the you know the, the investment fund that runs it. We're not really sure. People tried looking into it. It's not really clear who exactly is putting money in that hedge fund that runs Chelsea or owns it, that Boley. And Bowley I think his group. name is Egali, or yeah. who they're the faces for. And we don't know what, what the, where the money's coming from, really, but it doesn't really concern me. I just think it's very nice, the timing. Todd Bowley had a good meeting over in Saudi Arabia a couple of weeks ago, and all of a sudden now, um, well, we know Kante's gone, practically. Um, Kuli Bali's up for a bid. Ziyech's up for a bid. Mendy. Mendy's up for a bid. Um, Rumours of Cucurella might be up for a bid. Thank it's God. interesting how you're managing to shift all your quote-unquote deadwood. Oh, and today, what also came out, is that Callum Hudson Hudson Odoi is also now a target for them? So, how do you feel that you've now found a, a good outlay to overwrite financial fair play in Europe? Well, I didn't hear this complaints from Newcastle were having the same kind of treatment. I'm just gonna say Newcastle didn't get the same beef, so why are we anyway? Uh, moving who have, on, to, who have Newcastle sold to Saudi Arabia? I'm sorry, they're owned by Saudi Arabia, we, we, and we have issues with that. Yeah, but why else? Why we finished twelfth for crying out loud? Why, why is everyone getting on our back? You know, it was just like you know, maybe because you finished twelfth <laughs> last season. <laughs> we, we, we finished twelfth. We don't, not, you know, we've not seen how big our club is. People have got to leave. It's Sports Direct. It's, it's Sports Direct. JJB man, everything everything must go. Um, it's happening a lot quicker, but at the same time, they're losing. I'm losing players, but I'm happy are uh, going. Hudson Odoi was never going to come back. Ziyech does not want to be there since the moment he got there. Mendy was good for all of eighteen months. And Koulibaly, I don't know, Mafied his way out from Napoli, Cucurella. And anyway, um, so I'm happy that, well, look, 
it's happening. Cuc Cucurella is a rumour that probably won't happen, but the other three, definitely. I didn't say anything about him because I don't care about him. He's been rubbish this whole time he's been here. But yeah, um, <laughs> can you not tell? Can you not tell? <laughs> anything but him, that side through Bob. Um, yeah, it's happening very quick. Obviously, questions are going to be asked, but look, the word, unfortunately, but on a serious note, unfortunately, the word corruption has wormed its way into football a lot easier than the last five or six years. So unfortunately, with things like this, you're always going to, even when it's your own club, Man City, this, that, whoever, it's always going to hover over your head where it's like, how, just how legitimate is this? As long as certain nations, certain people, certain corporations are, in, are involved, it's always going to be a thing. But sticking with the whole Saudi Arabia thing, you know, there's always... The one thing this 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 you no know, encourages, or the one thing it questions where it gets asked, is a possibility of a certain league that we didn't want. It could still come back. It's ne it was never really dead. Now if they're going to get involved, and if they're you know offering the opportunity of Champions League football, there's nothing them stopping them. They're saying actually we can bring this whole thing back. So as I've said before, Saudi Arabia has been on the up when it comes to sporting events, WWE, boxing, recently the football. Formula One's going there. They say they don't want to go, but they still go and drive around there. It's going to be market. I mean, the way Marcus is right, it could just be a flash in the pan, China, America sort of thing. But they're just they're they're also branching out into other sports, you know, and making it the big thing to kind of like go to. So as much as I, it could just be a last like a year or two thing, if that Super League comes, the Super League thing does does come back. I know where my eyes are going to. That's all I'm going to say. It's not impossible because, you know, what's going to sell more? A Chelsea Arsenal in Stafford Bridge or um, Emirates or in Saudi Arabia? What would sell more? What's financially the bigger incentive? Well, you made a, made a good point on that. I, I do want to bring up this point. And you mentioned the Super League could return. I think for you, Craig, in terms of like, and I said it and Mark made a good point as well, like this option of the Champions League being on. Obviously, there is, there is a... Um, uh, a, a, I guess a Champions League equivalent that does exist for Asian teams that compete in obviously Ronaldo was unsuccessful last season with it um, you know failed miserably in the, I think it's called the AFC Champions League or Champions mm -hmm. Cup but you know could you conceivably see that we get to a point where choose of the money that's invested and I guess the quality of players that are going to Saudi Arabia which would you'd hope improve the quality of the league could you see the UEFA giving them an olive branch and saying, you know what, we will allow your champions or a few of your champions to compete in the Champions League in seasons to come. With this current president, no, but money talks. So you never know what could happen. Money can talk. If they're, if they're generating all the best players are going to Saudi Arabia. Well, yeah. caveat the best players, the best retire, retirement. Yeah, so retirement home players yeah. going to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> then it, it, could, it could be a discussion, but I don't think you'll go that far anyway. Well, maybe... You never know. I guess it depends on the age profile because obviously Hudson Odoi will be the youngest player if that move comes through. It's just paper talk right now. But if he did go to Saudi Arabia, that would be the youngest player of the mm. ones gone there so far. I think Ruben Neves was, you know, at 26. That's the prime of your career. It's a bit of a surprising move. And like you said, Mark, it's kind of in that indicative of how he probably views his career because every summer he's been doing the, the Wolves goodbye tour and they kept rocking up and I think he probably had enough to say no let's just get me out of Wolves okay just get me out of Wolves Saudi Arabia 400k a week huh I'm there Wilfred Zaha <laughs> uh, yeah well I mean Zaha's one's on not too. confirmed yet that's still we'll see if that happens but he's in his 30s so it's a bit different but I think you know when you're in your 20s to make that move it's a bit of a big big one mm, yeah, yeah definitely Career suicide, I say. The other side of it with, sorry, the other side of it with Neves is that, like Witzel, when he went to China, he went to China, he made a bunch of money for two years, and then he came back and played for Dortmund, and, oh, Ju Juventus and Dortmund, just back, back at kind of like the higher, the higher end of the game, but there's still maybe the chance that, you know, Neves goes and sets himself and his family up for two years, you know, on 400 grand a week until 28, and then makes a big move back to Europe and still is able to play at the highest level for two or three years of his, of his peak career. That, that's, that's also a potential pathway. 
That's a, that's a good point. And, and, yeah. And, and it could just be the right move to make. Sometimes, you know, and someone made this point actually online. They were saying that a lot of times with footballers, you know, they're supporting, sending people around them. Like you might just think it's a footballer and their immediate family, but there could be 20 people. Mm. Well, actually, there could be 20 families that they're supporting. So when you really think about it, the money makes a difference. I know for Oscar and Ramirez, their families were set for life. Oscar, it just still feels like a waste because I get it financially, but he never came back. So much to prove. Ramirez had been there, done that. He was happy to kind of just chill. But Oscar, I think he could have come back to Europe and done some more. That reminds me of another team though from Russia. Remember that Angie team when they yeah. were signing everybody? Mm -hmm. It could go south like that. It could, we just don't know. Look, if they allow one team, if they allow one Saudi team in the Champions League, we'll just sit, we'll just sit and watch. We'll just sit. I, I, I could I could see a way where, I could see a way where they justify because right now you know the Is Israeli teams do play in the Champions League and Israel is it's in the economic area for Europe but it's not technically in Europe we've talked about um, physical land mass space so there, there, there's ways they could they could kind of justify it but we're just gonna have to watch and see there's lots of things happening never say never it's like the Super League might be like you said it might be dead but it might come back it might be called the Saudi League Ooh, mm. how yeah, about that. Mm. But, you know, moving from player transfers, we're looking at managerial changes. There's been a lot going on this summer. Still waiting for some clubs to appoint managers. Um, we know that Tottenham have obviously made that appointment. Anger uh, Postogulu. I think that's how you say his name. I'm just going to call him that. I kept calling him the ex-Celtic boss, but I don't think that's fair. Anger. Uh, good appointment there. There's also new news that came out of Gary O'Neill being um, let go by Bournemouth. He's been replaced by Adoni Iraola. How highly do you rate that decision, Mark? And do you think that is them sort of projecting where they want to be as opposed to trying to chance it with Gary O'Neill and hoping that he can kind of keep building on what he did last season? Yeah, it's great business by Bournemouth. Absolutely great business. Like at the end of the day, like, you know, it's harsh and it's cutthroat, but it's, it almost reminds me of when Southampton hired Pochettino um, and, you know, they, they, they fired, was it Adams? Was, was that his name? The guy who got the, no, no, Atkins, Atkins, who got, got them up from League One and you thought, man, that is brutal. It's a brutal move. But, you know, as was the case then, all Pochettino needed to do first season was keep them in the Premier League when he came over. Um, and he did. And, and you know, he united that Southampton team and moved them forward to another level and showed that in his ability to go on to Tottenham and PSG and bigger things. And, you know, now Chelsea. Uh, I, I think Andoni Raiola is, is a young manager who is very exciting in Spain. He he grew up with Arteta and um, he played for Athletic Club Bilbao for the majority of his career, uh, my Spanish team. Um, so someone I know very well from a footballing career was a brilliant right back, but also has gone on to show that he understands how the game works. Um, his success last year, um, he took Rayo Vallecano to 11th, um, both beating Barcelona um, and Real Madrid um, actually has a better record against Barcelona. They won at home and drew at the new Camp, um, only lost by a goal to Real Madrid away and also drew away at Atletico Madrid as well. Um, so the results were, were really good and he's only young. I, I think he's ambitious. I, I think he's a great hire for Bournemouth. I, I you know, will, will Bournemouth stay in the Premier League? Probably. Will Bournemouth be able to push and do more? Well, it depends on the squad that they build, but they'll play good football. And, 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 and I think it's a, I think it's a very, a very good move. The type of move that I think the teams around that level need to be making if they want to be pushing up. Yeah, it's definitely a good, interesting decision to make and we'll see how, how well they progress. And, and like, there's lots of changes have happened. So, you know, they got to do what they got to do. I mean, looking down to the team that are now in the championship, Sheffield Wednesday, they let go of Darren Moore, which seemed to shock a lot of people. It was said to be by mutual consent. Um, but I, I still find that was a bit of a shocking, just a surprising decision because, I mean, he got them up to, yeah. to, to, through the playoffs um, you know, in terms of his, um, I was just looking through the win win rate percentages of their of their managers. His win rate percentage is fifty one point one six percent. You never know, but he only had two years, so maybe they didn't think it was good enough for, to build on. But I just think it's a bizarre decision to make. I guess for you, Matt, when you look at situations like that, obviously this one with Bournemouth, it's, it's a it looks like it could be a positive gamble. 
big big move on there. Do you think Sheffield Wednesday might regret it, or do you think it's just like a bit of a weird choice that they did at this time? The timing's a bit off because it hasn't been that long. I think it's only been it's been less than a month since they got promoted, and like you said, he hasn't had the longest of times to kind of establish himself on the team and what we got him promoted. I think he yeah, and actually this bad luck has followed him because he was at one point West Brom manager and they were competing in the top four. In fact, they were firmly in the hunt for a playoff and possibly even automatic promotion. And he got sacked as well. West Brom did come up, but they also, they also came down. Um, so maybe it's a case of like the Ian, luck of Ian Holloway where he can get you there. Maybe he can't like keep you there. So there's a club struggling for a, you know, a promotion struggle. He could be the guy that gets you in the position, but it all depends on who they're looking at for a championship slot, who's a brand new team in the championship. Maybe a Premier League manager, maybe a Premier League manager, a, a a manager who needs to earn his chops at a club with a lot of history, you know, someone like, I don't know, maybe want to give Gerard another go. He's in the prime position. It's in, it's in the championship. It's in the championship. Where I think where most of these players, where most of these guys should go. But, uh, but would uh, he take that position? Probably not. Probably not. But I think Vieira, Leeds were looking at Vieira, you know, Potter's in a, without a job, Brendan Rogers, where he's gone back to Celtic, but you get what I mean. I think, I think it's a good, Opportunity. That's what you call a project. A good opportunity for a newer up and coming manager to possibly get chef that maybe even back to back promotions. You never, never know. Any could be anything is possible against the championship. Absolutely anything. But I feel for Darren Moore because he's done all this to then be say but mutual consent, but I don't know. It depends on how much of but um, I believe it. I believe in it. But the championship yeah, I mean, is coming comfort. Just on the, on the Vieira news, yeah, he he is the front runner for the Leeds job now. Just could be quite interesting if he does get that. Might make me watch Leeds a bit more coming up next season. Um, in Southampton, they've announced Russell Martin. He's left Swansea and joined them. There's big changes there. We still don't have a new manager for Paris Saint-Germain. I'm repping their, their kit today. But um, it's li- rumoured to be Luis Enrique is very close to becoming the next manager. Do you think... If Enrique gets in, Craig, how well do you think PSG would do next season? Do you think they could finally win the Champions League if they keep Mbappe? I think I think if he comes in, if he does get the manager's job at PSG, he'll 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 get the right players that he wants. He'll get he'll get the right players that he wants in the team. He won't have the 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 the, the board giving him players that he doesn't want because he's always been that type of manager. When mm. he was at Barcelona, he got the players that he wanted to work in his system. And he would work, and he would improve Mbappe a lot. He'll get Mbappe up to the next Ballon d'Or level, I would say. He'll get him up to that level. And I feel that if he stays and he can build a team around him, I think PSG might have a chance. You never know. Mm. They could have a chance next season. So it's all up to him and see what if he gets the job. And and the board give him time as well because PSG are not a club that gives managers a lot of time. They don't. In one season, you're out. They are. They are so super they, impatient. I, I think them, they need to... If they want to win the Champions League, they say to Enrique, you know what? We're going to give you a full five-year deal and we're going to give you enough, to, we'll give you all the financial backing you need to buy the right players and, and get the right system and then take it from there. And, when, and if it doesn't work in year one, we'll give you another chance next year. But we need to see more progress in Champions League, not the league. We won the league, they won the league so many times now, so they want the big one. That's the Champions League. So, yeah. Cool. Well, we want to move on from a club that could do well to a club that, you know, it's comeback season. Let's talk Liverpool. We're going there, Mark. We're going over to come over to Anfield. Obviously, you of all of our teams, you're the one that's made the first signing this summer. Well, I guess, yeah, you are the one who made the first signing this summer. Obviously, Chelsea confirmed Christopher and Kunku, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a second. Because we've got a lot to talk about with you guys and, and what you're doing. But, you know, Alexis McAllister got over the line you finally strengthened in midfield which has been long overdue how do you feel about that business and some of the rumours that's been sort of lurking around in addition to him joining Liverpool yeah Alexi McAllis is good good a good deal um good business a lot cheaper than I expected which you know I think this kind of went under the radar um with Alexi McAllister that when he went to the World Cup, Brighton signed him on a new contract, but nobody really knew that he had a minimum release clause in that contract because um, everybody was talking about 60, 65, 70 million for a player that's just won the World Cup. And, you know, pretty smart by Alexa McAllister to 
to you know say look i'll stay but i i, I want to release clause because i want to be able to leave i want to be in the list of players that goes on to to, to to bigger things no disrespect to brian they're a fantastic football club um but um but yeah i think it's time for him to you know even though we'll both be in the europa league next year um play at a higher level um and hopefully compete for for more the great thing about alexi McAllister is he he's a young jordan henderson profile in in the fact that he can play the you know the six he can play the eight and he can play the ten um so you know he he really he really does give us options in midfield and and the ability to to really be flexible if we want to play Trent as the six then Alexi Alexa uh, McAllister can play as the eight um if 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 it came to it you know and we we bought a more defensive minded midfielder you know there's Manu Kone um who has been linked with us um there from Borussia Mönchengladbach for example um you know and there's still Fabinho around so if we if we wanted two defensive midfield minded players Alexi McAllister could play as as the 10 um you know so for me I think it's a great signing it's 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 a it's a piece of business that gives you the flexibility now to to go out and sign more specifically um the pieces of the puzzle that you want so no i'm i'm happy it's it's got to be the the start of the business there still there still needs to be one or two more midfielders coming through the door and one thing that i am going to i'm just going to put out there into the into the ether and and and, and we'll we'll see is um that liverpool obviously didn't sign Jude Bellingham and and said that they weren't signing Jude Bellingham because they couldn't afford a Ferrari. Um, but I I do think it's interesting that there is a another Ferrari with one year left on his contract um, at the moment who um, could be an interesting potential move um, for Liverpool and and that is of course Kylian Mbappe. Um, and you know I I say this considering you look at how far short Liverpool have fallen from Manchester City this season, and mainly because of the qualities that is Erlen Haaland um, and that ability to score so many goals um, from, you know, that front forward position. Um, and obviously Real Madrid are the number one candidates for Kylian Mbappe. And you would think that if, um, you know, Real Madrid pull their money out of their pocket, that Kylian Mbappe would end up at Real Madrid. Um, however, the fact that Real Madrid have spent the money that they've spent on Jude Bellingham, knowing that Kylian Mbappe is going into the final year of his contract and they could sign him on a free contract in Janu- January, and PSG not wanting to lose him um, for, for, for no money, it could just be one of them things in which Liverpool could test the waters of Real Madrid's actual interest in getting that deal across the line by putting in a 60 65 70 million pound offer and just saying okay let's play ball let, 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 let's see what happens and liverpool could potentially afford to do it because they haven't spent the money that they'd spent on jude bellingham now i'm not saying they will but i i think it's just an interesting thing to put out there and and and, and have kind of in the mix of potential things that could happen at liverpool this summer well it's definitely an interesting option i think mbappe to liverpool would be would be a smart play I think that could be could be interesting. What do you guys think? Mbappe to Liverpool. That would be a massive that would be a statement in intent. If you get if they get Mbappe, then mm. then you have to look at Liverpool as one of the biggest challenges next season in the league. That would be a massive yeah. that would be like a that would be Liverpool's biggest sign in a long time. In a while. And I mean since I think it would be their biggest sign. It'll be their biggest ever sign in a World yeah. Cup winner. Still at the right age of twenty in its early stage of twenty, so He'll be there for what seven, eight years, maybe nine years. A long time. Stand by. I said, I believe I said it last week that if there's one place I think he's gonna go, it's there, and I'll stand and I'll stick by it. It's it it's a fifty fifth. I know it's a fifty one percent chance it could happen. So I'm gonna stick with, stick with that. But it would I think it would make the Premier League even more exciting because now it's got those more headline players. So. Yeah, I'm open for it. I think for me, the only thing that would make me believe Real Madrid would not go for him is the fact that they need a guaranteed number nine and Mbappe doesn't really want to play through the middle 
so much at this point in his career. So that that's what makes me think that maybe the door is maybe, maybe more than 51%. I'd probably say probably 65% likely mm. that's a viable option. Um, obviously, Real Madrid have also signed Hossolu, former Newcastle striker. <laughs> that guy is, I mean, his agent is doing a great, great job. So they've, they've got him on, on a short-term deal, but they've got their striker, a striker of sorts. There's been lots of rumours about Harry Kane, so they might make a push there. Obviously, Mbappe is the one they wanted. They might go there. But that it kind of leaves a door open for someone else to make that move for Killian. I want to throw a couple extra names to you, Mark, as well, in terms of for Liverpool, because there's, there's three names that have popped up recently on the rumour rumor mill and what you think about them. The first one is Nicola Barella from Inter Milan, who we uh, thought was going to go to Newcastle, but they've pulled off an interesting deal. My goodness, I'm going to touch on that very shortly, very quickly. That's one up, one player that's linked with you guys. Also, Ryan Gavin Birch, which I think that one has legs, and you have mentioned that as well. And um, there's a centre-back called Mickey van der Veen from Wolfsburg. So those three players, of the three, would you be happy with all three, or is there two in particular that you'd want over the other? Um, don't know too much about the centre back. Um, we do need a centre back, um, so you know I, I think that's that is inevitable. Van Dyke's, um, you know, finally able to get taken on a little easier than he used to. Um, Gomez is being plagued with injuries, and it just isn't the the player that's really ever going to be what we hoped he'd be. And there's talk that Matic might exit um, as well this summer too. So I, I think a centre back is needed. Um, who that centre back is, I I don't know, um, and I, I don't know enough about the Wolfsburg guy to say whether or not he would be a good enough signing for us. Um, Barella is a player I rate highly. Um, I think everyone who watched the Champions League final sees his quality. Um, he's a he's a talent. He's he's very very good on the ball, um, and would be a a, a kind of number eight. Um, you know, who can take the ball forward and move the ball forward, uh, you know, and, and and a player that I would be be very happy if we if we signed a Liverpool. And, and you know, the same can be said for Ryan Gravenberg. I think he's gone to Bayern early in his career and hasn't been given chance to, to play. Um, he's not had enough game time. Um, but I think there's a talented youngster there who, you know, given the right club and the right environment, you know, he's... He's more physical um, than Barella um, and and I think is a different profile um, for the same role, um, but someone who who I would I would definitely take as well. I think, you know, if, if Liverpool sent Barella and Gravenberch and had Barella, Gravenberch, McAllister as their three midfield signings, I'd, I'd come out of this window incredibly happy. Yeah, it would definitely make you guys very strong. I think... You know, yeah, you, you need strengthening. We we know that um, Virgil van Aura, you can't get away with that defending anymore. I'm sorry, it's just not. It's just it's just not. I mean, some of the goals he's conceded for international level, it's just it just makes you want to like. It's like is this really Virgil van Dijk? Like, what's going on here, bruv? Like, you are better than this. Just be ashamed of yourself. But one club who are definitely showing that strategy and patience pays off. Newcastle, breaking news today. Sandro Tonali is on his way there. £70 million deal. That, and I need to caveat that with a lot of context. So, back end of loss of this past season gone, um, uh, Paolo Mandini, who has been their director of football, kind of been overseeing all the football operations of what they've done. He's been monumental in bringing them back to the top table in them winning Scudetto a couple of seasons ago. Was fired. <laughs> And that news shocked us when the season ended. We thought that was just bizarre. And that conversation was around in reinvestment into the club and he was not happy with the direction the club were planning to take. And now we're starting to see the fallout from that because he's gone. Slatan, well, football retired from Slatan, as we said. <laughs> and now Tanali's leaving. So I wouldn't be surprised if someone put in a massive bid for um, Rafael Leal and is able to pr pr prize him away this summer because, I mean, he did a post when he heard the news and he was like, I can't believe this. What the, like, what are you serious? Maldini's gone. gone. Mm. So it's, the AC Milan. it's crazy. But I'll start with you, Craig. This news of Tonali going to Newcastle, how big is that? And and is this now Newcastle showing that in spite of uh, Mark's thoughts on Aston Villa, that they actually here to stay in the top four? <laughs> I, I, think, I think I think this signing is, is showing it's absolutely showing that that they 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 qualify for Champions League and they want to make that marquee signing and Tonali's a marquee signing. 
70 million is a lot of money to buy one player. Mm. And he's won the Sigetto Sget- Sget- yeah. in, in Italy. And um, he's a good midfield player. He's in, in, it's Italian international. He's a baller, man. Baller. I think we would all take him at our clubs. 100%. Comfortably. Yeah. I think we wanted him yeah. at yeah. our clubs. Just just tough tough yeah. tackler. Good with, his, good with his feet. This is just a good player. Overrun, overrun, good player. It's going to make Newcastle even better. And that means him and Gromarez in that midfield next season, with whoever, Joe Willock or whoever, they can push Gromarez further forward, have him sit, have um, Tonali sit in in that midfield like a number six. They, they could do, they could. Yep. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, th- so, I think that, that could be the yeah, player I'm missing interest yeah. in. I mean, for you, Mark, when you read that news, is he a player that you looked at and thought, I'm, I'm going to have to get hold of Liverpool ownership and say, guys, if tonight is on the move, why are we not in that conversation? I, again, look, it's just, it's just a lot of money, isn't it? But what a player. Um, you know, he, he is, and also, you know, we're now competing with a team in the Champions League. So, you know, what, what a player, you know, he, he is like basically the modern day Perlo, like maybe the best example of a modern day Perlo that there is out there. And, you know, he, he sits deep, he's good on the ball, he can spray the pass, um, you know, but he's got enough about him that he can physically get the ball back and break the play up. And, look, like, you know, I watched a couple of clips of, of Bruno Gomarish last year and thought, this guy is too good to be playing so deep. Like, you know, and and I think Tenali sitting will give him some freedom, like Craig says, that, that, that will be exciting to see. And, and that midfield of... You know, Tenale, Tenale, Willock, and Gamarish is is a is a starting to shape out to be a very special midfield. And you know, they probably will have Joe Linton starting some games as well. So you'd have Joe Linton and Bruno attacking the box. It could be quite interesting. Ooh. They're building something nice over there, Newcastle. You know, maximum on the wing. Well, the rumours he might be moving on. So, but yeah. putting him to one side, they're building something quite nice over <laughs> there. Um, just, just what one more thing for you, Mark? Because obviously, the, we're going to start off with you and then bring it over to the man who is his current club owner, a local lad from Chelsea who's not really a Chelsea boy, but is a Chelsea boy, Mason Mount, subject of further bids from Manchester United, who want to bring him to Manchester and add him as to part of their kind of crown jewels and stuff. What do you think about that transfer move in general? And do you think that will be the right call for Mount to go to Manchester United? from Chelsea and how do you think about this whole saga of him leaving there in general yeah look I think I think Mount wanted more money Chelsea didn't want to give him more money um you know Chelsea have a lot of options um but but you don't and shouldn't spend the money that you're spending on a player of the quality or you 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 know you, you shouldn't have to be losing the player of the quality that is Mason Mount um when he came through your academy you know and an academy boy, um, you know, you spend the time training him, investing in him, building him up. You don't, you don't then want to be seeing that player go out out of the door. For, you know, no matter how much money it is, just before he's about to hit the prime of his career. So, um, yeah, no, look, I, I think it's, I think it feels like that deal is edging closer and closer. It, it's a good signing for Man United. It, 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 you know, I don't think it, I don't think it changes. I don't think it changes the game, you know, incredibly for them. But it's another good quality midfielder that they're signing and that they're bringing into the to the team, and and I think that will that will help them, um, you know, in that position because he's he's a talented young boy. Yeah, it's going to be a big big loss for. Oh, it's a big game for Manchester United. I'm not sure if it's a big loss for Chelsea because you're still looking to buy people, even though you know you and Manchester City shouldn't be allowed to buy anyone this summer. But hey. Um, on that note, Gundogan's going to Barcelona, so that's good news. But they're also looking to buy Kovacic from you. So what's that all about? Thirty million pounds. As what well. is that all about? No, no, I think they had his. I think before he came to Chelsea, they had their eye on him anyway, or it might have been Jorginho. I can't remember. But he's he's lost his partner in Jorginho, and without him, he can't really match up with any other really other Miami midfielders. He's not a goal scorer. He, the ball will be on the line. He'll look for a pass or he'll probably miss. Not to say that he's not a good player. He's a fantastic player. And you know what? Funny enough, I mentioned before, if you look at his trophy sheet, if you look at what he's got, it's actually nuts with what he's had in his trophy cabinet. It's what I can't get over. Thinking He has all of this. As yeah, I'm like, but Danny Simpson has a Premier League award. So... No, but he has like multiple Champions Leagues, multiple things. I know, he's, 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 you know, he's a really good player. I, I think probably wasn't the best fit at, fit at Chelsea, but I just signed it. 
if him going to Man City, I think when a player, when a club like Man City are looking to buy one of your players and their, their ascendancy, that's a trend with that idea. Maybe you should veto the transfer. I mean, just maybe. I'd rather not go, I'd rather not any of my players go to a rival, especially when they're on the ascendancy or challenging where we want to be challenging, which is the most bizarre thing at most. But I, just, I also just think that him losing Jorginho has not really brought out the best in him. He hasn't been good for a couple of years and it was clear that we're going in a different direction that doesn't see him as a partner midfield. I mean, our midfield's getting picked at. You got Jorginho, he's off to City. Kante's, um, he, um, he's off to Man City. Kante's gone to Saudi Arabia. Uh, Ruben Loftus cheek, he'll be next going somewhere. You know, we're looking to change. We're going in a direction, you know, or how much is Poch having involved? How much is Todd Bowley having involved? We're clearly going in a new direction where clearly these players are just haven't demonstrated good enough attributes this season. And we are where we are for a reason. So, you know, it's, it's something, it's something he's got to give. Well, like I said, I think it's very bizarre to, to be happy and open to selling to your rivals. I'm not happy. Well, I mean, you're open. Your club are open to He's it. You're, happy. Not, you're not happy, but I'm your club are happy. open to it. You're strengthening up rivals. I mean, I say rivals in the loose sense of the word because you're not really Man City's rival anymore because you guys are struggling to do anything useful. But Craig, obviously, you know, there's the news coming out as well about Arsenal reaching an agreement in principle of Chelsea to sign Kai Havertz. Um, the fee seems to be debated much online. Some people say it's like 65 plus this. I've Arsenal sources are saying it's more close to 60 million plus a few bits of add-ons here and there. So it might make the total thing close to 70 million, but it's not too bad. How do you feel about that that deal and that transfer? What's your thoughts on it? I'm surprised because I didn't see that one coming, honestly. I didn't see... Havertz, he, he, he spell at Chelsea's up and down. He won the Champions League. Yeah. And after that, He's been non-existent. Let's be honest. Let's be brutally honest, Matthew. He's been non-existent for you guys. Very un inconsistent. He's still young. He's only like 23, 24. Yeah. I feel like he had, he's had, how many coaches he had now? Three or four managers now, yeah. hasn't he? Had, he kept, um, Lampard, two cool, Lampard again. So he's only had one manager in this time of Chelsea. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that was the manager that got the best, best out of him. Yeah. Tom Tuchel got the best out of him. Let's be, let's be honest. And I don't know what's his best position on the pitch. At Chelsea, they're playing him as a false nine. Mm. I thought I'd love to see what Arteta does with him if he can revive his career because Arteta's very good in with, with players getting the best out of them when you're thinking you're not sure why did you get that player. Like, like for example, Ramsdale. Everyone was saying why did you get Ramsdale and look what Ramsdale did in the end. Sure. Same with um, who else did he get? Look at Martinelli when Martinelli first came when Arteta first came. Martinelli wasn't playing him much last season, and then this season just taken last season just taken it by. The, the un, unplayable, even Saka, he transformed Saka's game as well. So he knows what he know. We have to have faith in him and see what he does with 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 um with Havertz. I, I think I think there's also two good two key things about the Havertz deal that's really interesting to me. The first one is that Havertz himself insisted that it was only Arsenal he wants to go to because Bayern Munich were interested, and he said no, I want to go to Arsenal, which says a lot about his mentality and his belief in what he can do. Secondly. As a player, he's described himself as more of like a number eight. So he likes to play more in mid that midfield areas. And he's like in his his footballing inspiration is Iniesta as a player that he is, you know, you know, when a player describes Iniesta as an inspiration, for me, I, I expect to see certain aspects in your game. I know Bruno Fernandez has claimed that Iniesta is his, is his inspiration, but we all know Fernandez, we don't see that on the pitch, bruv, at all. We don't see it. So I don't know which, maybe you meant Iniesto, the postman, but not Iniesta. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, obviously the, this transfer, I mean, it looks like it's going to go ahead. It has come out of a massive surprises. It's, you know, we talked about last podcast about like the thoughts on it and you, you know, it's an interesting one, but do you now, now kind of seeing like the, how it's unfolding and how the player himself is pushing for this move to Arsenal? Like I said, I think it's strange to be selling to a club that's on the ascendancy you know, and it's you and your rivals. Like it's, we're not like we're not friends, Chelsea and Arsenal. We're not friends. But do you think that this indicates that Havertz will probably be a success at Arsenal if he does get that move? Well, he can do what he wants. He just doesn't want to be with us anymore, and that's fine with me. He can go and do whatever he wants. We've, if what's said to be true, he's saying he sees himself as more as Iniesta, and he's played, he's been played out of position. That's on us. Um, but 
in all due respect, he was never going to get into that place while not one as a Kante, Jorginho, Kovacic firmly establishing themselves in that midfield and doing so well. He was never even going to get there in the first place. Plus, hmm. like you said, under Tuchel, we got a really good, we got really the, the best out of him, taking away the whole thing on the Champions League goal. He plays well on that side, well, really well with somebody going ahead. He's not, he's not a striker, which I respect that playing him in the wrong place. You're, you're going to annoy a player to the point that's like, well, you're not respecting my wishes. I'm going to go somewhere else. Fair enough. Um, but it's, I'm, I'm, I'll believe it when I see him in that red shirt, but at the same time, it's like, you know, he's, he doesn't want to be there anymore. Fair enough. We're more willing to cut ties. And it was really hard to kind of see him. I know I said last week, it would be interesting. We'll see what Pochettino could, could, could do with someone like him. Because I think that the characteristics that him and I set a share is working well with younger players and players that have a point to prove. And he's just not part of that plan. We've got Nkuku coming in, which will fill that hole relatively quite nicely, depending on what kind of striker we could get. Um, but look, we got to look, look, we are not in the position where where we finished now, the season petered out. We're not, we're not, we're not in the position to be that demanding. We've got a real big job to get us back into that European, like hole, that like European groups. So, you know, if a player feels like feels like they can do somewhere else, and plus, I don't want them sticking down around, around the joint. The same way you bit, the same way you bit the bullet when get rid of a Bamiyang and even second in the league. So, yeah. mm. him being around just could be just poisoning up the whole whole ship. Could be, and also sometimes players just don't fit certain environments. You you need to change the environment to really kind of, as they say, unlock yourself and play to your better football. Let's talk about outgoings. Lots of let's talk Arsenal. Let's talk about Arsenal. Let's talk a lot about everybody. Let's talk about Arsenal. So, lots of bids being put in. Edu mm-hmm. has been busy at the barbecue this summer. You know, he took a little little <laughs> break, is cooking up some great food on the barbecue, and he's come back with a vengeance. We've seen in the past few days, we've seen bids for Declan Rice, which we've known about for months, and we've just been waiting for that to kind of come through. Kai Havertz which surprised everyone. And now the latest to be added to that list of players is Jurian Timber from Ajax as a potential right back slash right centre back slash defensive midfielder cover. So basically we're going to have three players that are, or actually technically four players that tactically can occupy three positions. Kivior, who was left back, well, left centre back we signed him as, played left back last games of the season. Played DM at his previous club. Tommy Asu, centre back for the national team, right back for us. And we could probably chuck him in central and hold him midfield if we needed to. Actually, maybe even five now. Ben White, centre back, right back, probably could do it and has played hold midfield for Leeds back in the day. And now Timber. How, how excited are you about the potential of him coming in? And also another player who was adamant that he didn't want to go to Bayern Munich wanted to come to Arsenal, also ignored the option of going to Manchester United and linked up with his former boss. But how do you feel about that potential off, potential deal coming together and him joining us? I think he's going to be a great signing. He done well at Ajax. He worked on the Ten Hag, good manager. Mm. So he he, he know he's a very solid defender. I think he'll do well at Arsenal. I feel like Arteta will get the best out of him. And we need we need some reinforcements in defence because last season, as you can see, when William Sleever got injured, our season kind of capitulated after that. So we need some young, and he's quite pacey as well. It's very mm. quick. And then I want, like, same way, like our last season when Man United bought um, Martinez. Everyone was not sure about Martinez. Everyone was like, I'm not sure. But look, look how good he was in the end. So I think he'll be as good as, as and then two play together, at Ajax together. So they were very good together. So I think he'll be good at Arsenal. So I'm very happy with that. With the Deck and Rice one, I'm very, I can't wait for it to get over the line. I think that will happen. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty clear that, and I think what, what's really changed it from my understanding is that the, the clubs had like a gentleman's agreement with West Ham in terms of like a fee, which is why Arsenal bid what they bid for the first bid. Since the Europa Conference League victory, West Ham are looking for a bit more money and it's kind of annoyed people at Arsenal, but we're still bidding. We're bidding in, in bits and props. I mean, we could we could just chuck the bag and give 100 million right now, mm. but that's going to impact every other deal we do. And it's the same way with... Um, uh, Mason Mount and Chelsea how they're bidding in weird increments it's like this amount up like they'll increase the amount up front and then they'll kind of lower down the add-ons amount so it's like slightly more overall mm. but you're getting more up front so they, they, they'll, they'll, they'll get to the right number eventually it'll probably be something close to 90 plus 10 add-ons I think is what we'll probably it's end up this. doing it's just that it's just timing and he's on holiday right now so I think it should get wrapped up mm-hmm. when he gets back 
Yeah, so that'll be good to get Declan Rice in, see what he does with Kai Havertz. So we, we get we're getting we're getting players in. So I, I want to see how well we do in pre season with the new players, mm. and how they fit in in the club, and then new season we've got like Nottingham Forest. We've got some we've got some winning more matches in the first couple of games of the season. So. Well, I'm not taking I'm not taking some of the teams for granted because we have to go on, on the pitch and win the matches. So that's yeah, the do. most important thing. So we have to make sure we start well like I did last season. And this time, hopefully win the league this time. Don't don't fall fall off. So Well, that's the thing. I think as a minimum for Arsenal, you know, for this coming season, you would want top four again, minimum. You'd probably want to finish in the top three again. Mm. I'd say I'd even say go as far as say second would be. But I think I think overall you say top four finish again as a very minimum. You then want to have a good strong run in Europe, mm. and you're talking like at least last eight, maybe even last four, mm. but at least last eight. Mm. You know, not round of cool. sixteen. Let's get to last eight. And shall, shall we get at that point, mm. and then win one, one or both the domestic cups? Like you really want to go strong this season. But Definitely. but just looking at obviously players' options as well. Obviously, there's also been talk about you know, Kai Sado that's been going around for ages, and then we talked about it, the Rice Sado thing last podcast. Yeah. We don't know what's going on going on there because you guys are linked with him. You know, Kante is leaving, so you need a player that's going to have that sort of stature and presence in midfield and what Kante could do at his best, which Caicedo could be. There's also now talk about Romeo Lavio. Lavio as an option to at Arsenal, and I'm I'm quite intrigued by that because I think when we when we played Southampton, he definitely made Thomas Partey look old. Mm. <laughs> um, but for it's you, Matt, when you, when you hear about that kind of talk of potentially Lavia to Arsenal, what, where do you? What's your kind of view on that? Do you think that would be a good move, not just for him, uh, um, but how do you think that would play out if he was to come over to Arsenal? Um, if he came over, um, it would, he doesn't deserve to be in that Southampton team. Doesn't deserve to be. He's one of the bet, better players, probably the best player that kind of came from there but he's going to be part of a big project moving forward like you're in the Champions League you're only five points five points behind the team and one with treble mm. um, that spot is going to be there waiting for him once he loses like sort of Thomas Partey and potentially even Granite Xhaka plus the link up with Declan Rice it shows that it's strength it not, not, not only shows that you're serious about these kind of signings and you want to make a point it's like strength in depth so if one player's out another can player can come in so if, if you're afforded to have someone like him and possibly Kai Herbert's on the bench you know that you're doing something right you're preparing for extra competitions like you said because you want to be you want to if there's one criticism that you had from last season was that your cup competitions you did really really poorly mm -hmm. now cup competition can do a lot for a manager and a player because it just shows that you know in all the extra games that you had while still maintaining a good stat state in the league, it means you're fighting on so many fronts. So it shows good squad rotation, players get used, their morale boosts up. And for all you know, it might be an encouragement to go on to go further in the next season. Now that could be your thing. Let's say the league doesn't work out this year because Man, Man City are looking to possibly even get stronger. They're probably have been going after the quadruple, but you you can, if you don't get them in the league, you can get them in the other cups, like you said, Carabao, FA Cup of Dublin, that will do your players such a world of good. It'll be a fantastic achievement. You know, building and building and building, you're failing forward. So even the second place finish with two trophies, it, will anything be an even better season? Mm. Because it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a statement of ambition that your new signings have clearly worked. You're working towards some way forward. Could you imagine someone like him and Declan Rice in their first time of asking coming in, let's say you get to the semi-finals of the Champions League and you get, you know, get to a final for both Carabao and, you know, for the FA Cup. Or let's say what happens is, let's say the Champions League doesn't work out, but you end up in the Euro Europa League. You win that, which gets you into the UEFA Super Cup final. That's back-to-back -back finals for someone like Declan Rice, Declan Rice and the first time for someone for like someone like Lavia. So you're, that, that's, that's hindsight though, isn't it? So if all goes well for you, I mean, that's how you should look at it and be looking at it for next season. I think it's going to be a great addition for you. It's, it's the word is exciting and depth. Yeah, I think the thing I'm, I like need. I like a lot about how we're going about our business this summer is that we are doing multiple deals. And we're not just like we're doing deals. We've been working on these for months because these transfers, they don't just happen overnight. Timber, that you can tell that's been months of work. Rice, we know has been like months of work. Lavia, again, that seems like one that's, you know, been conversation been happening throughout throughout the season as the years progressed. The other player, which could be quite an interesting one, instead of like an outgoing, Thomas Partey, talks that we are open to um, you know, offers from Saudi Arabia for him 
if the right offers come in. I think it's interesting that he's a player that's up or potentially up for sale from Arsenal. It's very interesting for me because we know Granit Jack is likely to leave as well because he and his family, they want to go back to Germany. His wife wants to go back to Germany, so that makes sense. And I think at this time, you know, this is like his last contract move, I guess he's, he's going to get. Payday, yeah. It's not so much the payday, it's more to move to a club at a certain level. You know, mm. I don't know if he's going to get that kind of move again if he stay for another season at Arsenal too. But also the opportunity to go on, go into coaching post football in Germany. So they have a great system that would work quite well for him. So it makes a lot of sense. But Thomas Partey, you know, we've all known he's been one of our key players for years and years and years and years and years mm. when he's fit. <laughs> and we also know that Arteta has been very ruthless in general. And I think as fans have been calling for him to be more ruthless with what, how we do stuff. And so I know people are a bit surprised that Partey is potentially at the shopping block. But let's just be honest. Last season in the run-in, that brother fell off a cliff. The game against Man City, poor, poor. Southampton at home, poor. Liverpool away, poor. <laughs> West Ham away, poor. <laughs> like there's so many games I can think of where Partey, I mean, the fact that our last two games of the season, where did Partey play? Right back. Inverted right back. <laughs> Says everything. Not in Forest game, he was poor. And then he, found his feet last game of the season but um how do you feel about the news of him potentially moving on putting aside rumors alleged rumors of other stuff but just on a footballing note not about the other stuff how do you feel about that i was a bit surprised but you know when i look at it now i think artessa's had enough like he's been patient he's been very patient with him and i think his injury record is what stopped it i stopped him being a success like has been his injury record is very poor He's a classy player. We like him. On you know, he's a Rolls Royce of a footballer. But he can't. He can't stay. He hardly stays fit. He have. He'll play. He'll play five games consistent. So he'll play mm. five consistent games. Then the sixth game, he might get. He might go on international break and come back. He's injured. Have you noticed? Every time he goes on international duty, he comes back. He's injured. I don't know. I don't know what it is. No, honestly, Matthew. Every <laughs> time he goes on international break, I'm just praying. I'm saying, I hope he doesn't get injured. I hope he, and when he comes back and plays the next game after international break. Rocked. He, he, he's not the same player. Mm. Like, like last season, for example, when we had when he had the international break before, toward, I think it was before the end of the season, he came back. He was not the same player after that. No. That was a game when um, I think that game was who did we play after that game? I think we played. Um, who did we play? I don't know what game it was, but we played a game and he didn't he didn't look himself at all. Mm. So, Squad yeah. player. I mean, cups. Look, I think he 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 is definitely he has been our starter a lot. And he's definitely be one of the first names you'd put on the team sheet as things are. I think the fact that Arteta is happy to move on from him or is or is at least open to accepting offers for him to me says that he's ready to move the team on to another level. I think what we saw the last two games of the season is quite interesting because rather than invert the left back because Zinchenko and his injuries, we inverted the right back this time. So Partey was actually playing. So our, if we had Kivior, um, Gabriel and White, effectively were a back three in possession, you know, they set to back three and Partey was next to Jorginho in midfield. Then you had Erdegaard and Xhaka as the two. So it was a box four in midfield. And then above them, you had, you know, uh, Trossard, um, Gabriel and Saka. So we were a lot more offensive. But, I could, but you know, if you think about who we're looking at signing, you could swap out Partey in that same role, the right-back position. You could put in Timber. He's comfortable in midfield. Tommy Asu's back fit. Then it's the, it, it inverts the other way around. So it's like, you know, the left. So Kivio, who would be starting left, who was playing left back in that system, it'd be Zinchenko instead. So he's shifting it. So I, I could see how what Arteta wants to have is just multiple flexibility instead of that midfield three. And you think about Kai Havertz coming in, you know, if he's if he's going to play in the role that Shaka played, not the position, but the role he played, and you're thinking about that midfield setup. So you say we do the right back inversion. So you have the back three of, um, let's say it is. Let's say it's Kivio. No, let's say it's Gabriel, uh, Saliba White. And then you have um, Timber drops into midfield in possession. You've got Timber Rice, Erdegaard, Havertz. And then you've got Martinelli, Gabriel Jesus and Saka. 
And you just think about how Havertz and Gabriel and Gabriel can just, the, I'm just thinking about the, the movement and the rotations and even like, you know, some of the runs that Saka was making for, against, for England the other day mm. and Havertz just dropping the ball into him. Like there's, there's possibilities, possibilities there. So, you know, I can see I can see it working quite well. I mean, even in, you know, if we have Lavia, you can even have some games where you have um, Rice playing in the position where Xhaka played and you have Lavia at the base or if he stays party at the base. There's lots of options we could have there. Or even Caicedo, if we if that's the deal we go for. So I'm quite happy with what Arsenal are doing. Um, and we'll see. Mm. I think I think what's different now is you can tell that, you know, Arteta's moving the team on to another level. So rather than have only 11 players that he really trusts, he's looking to have 14, 15, 16, 17 players. Mm. You know, and I haven't even mentioned Reese Nelson as a rotation. I've not even mentioned Smith Rowe as an option there. You know, Fabio, Fabio Vieira, Vieira, who should be proper there. You know, George, good old boy George. You know, I think um, Kai Havertz was very upset when Jorginho left Chelsea. So maybe that very might be a upset, connection yeah. they could reconnect on the pitch. And they actually connected really well. They did. They did. And then, yeah. you know, so we'll see. I mean, the final thing I'll bring up, another player that's... Um, had a really great season, potential player that could get picked up by someone is Xavi Simons. What's really interesting is he has a 6 million euro buyback clause for, for PSG, which is only active for the month of July. So will someone make an attempt to go for him? Man United, Arsenal, Brighton, Spurs, Dortmund and Leipzig have all interested clubs. They've been made aware of this clause in his contract, but do you think he'll end up back at PSG or do you think one of the other teams will, will snap him up? I mean, would you take him at Chelsea? I'll take him. Considering the mess of your team, I don't know if you'd go though. Get him to England. but I'll take him, sense. but it's a case of with a lot of the other players, the deals we have coming through right now are deals that we've already sorted. Um, and, you know, some of the deals are still fresh. January wasn't that long ago. So if anything, some of them are still brand new. So it would be a case of me wanting to take him. It could be a case of, like you said, would he come and where would he go? What would he do? Question for you on that note. Xavi Simons, Conor Gallagher. Hmm. That's hard. <laughs> it is because I refuse to believe, because Conor Gallagher has only ever worked on the Frank Lampard when he's been there. I don't think he had much of a shine to Tuchel and Tuchel didn't give much. By the time he came on the scene, Tuchel was already gone. So it's going to sound mad because I know there's a good player in there and refuse to use, uh, refuse to have the potential of losing another talented prospect. I'm going to give Conor Gallagher, you owe me, and give him a chance to Great. prove me wrong. Gallagher or Javi Simons? Simon was Simon was tearing off last season and in, in, yeah. in, he was tearing off in Europa League and, and I'm gonna give him a league. chance. But give I feel like chance. I feel like Chelsea needs to start like looking after their homegrown players because you can't be losing all your homegrown talent because if the quota in the Premier League comes up, they said you need to have certain homegrown talent on mm. the twenty. They're gonna have to end up buying another homegrown talent when you've got loads of homegrown talent in your squad already. So if you end up losing another one, it'll be a, it'll be a shame. One ain't going nowhere is James. He ain't going nowhere. Oh, he's a good player. Yeah. Very good player. Well, there's lots of changes happening, lots of deals going on as we speak. People are bidding here, there and everywhere. People want to get players. People are making their moves. But we'll see what happens next week. Um, breaking news, David De Gea and May United yet to agree over new contracts. So he might end up moving on. Uh, hopefully not, because he's a great player and he should definitely never leave Manchester United. <laughs> um, but if they end up moving on from him, so be it. But thanks everyone for listening. Who are you most excited to see make moves? What transfer are you looking forward to hearing about? Do you think Havertz will be a success at Arsenal? If not, let us know. Have a good rest of the day. We'll see you all next time. Peace. Peace.